Hi guys, welcome back to Introduction to Sociology with Dr. John and today we're continuing with a topic of deviance but today we're focusing more on crime uh, which of course is a formal uh, definition of deviance. Do you agree with this statement? It is said that no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. Nelson Mandela. You may remember him. He was a freedom fighter in South Africa who spent his entire life fighting the apartheid system that gave all power to a minority of white citizens. Um, and of course, he was put in prison uh, for life, but eventually released and became president, elected president of South Africa in a, uh, when apartheid was finally ended. Now, this is an interesting idea that if you think about it is really fundamental to the notion of a democratic society. This is the idea that we need to look at how we treat the worst among us, rather than just how we treat the best among us. And English common law, in fact, very much relies on the concept of focusing on the lowest common denominator in order to understand and appreciate the conception of what we consider our civil rights and our human rights. So what is crime? Crime is an act of deviance that is specifically prohibited by law. In other words, crime only exists with refer reference to the state. We can say something's a crime in joke, but specifically a cri criminal act must be specifically prohibited by law. Obviously, that law, as we talked about before in our discussion of norms and mores, laws are usually a formalized aspect of our mores, our stronger normative system. Another thing that may influence very much the notion of crime are other cultural concepts. So, for example, in English common law, which is the, which is the basic legal concept established in the United States, crime can only exist if there is guilt. So guilt is the idea that you know that you did something wrong. So there has to be an, some kind of acknowledgement or a deliberate act of criminal intent. Uh, now we do have other categories of actions which are penalized uh, but they're usually penalized at a lower level. For example, murder is the deliberate, intentional murder, killing of somebody else. But we don't consider it complete unless the person had knowledge that they were, what they were doing was wrong. This is why we have this concept of um, mental exclusion. Uh, so, for example, somebody who's, who's insane and does not understand what they're doing, they do not have guilt or they do not understand what they're doing, or a child or something. Even if a child uh, kills somebody intentionally, we would say that child does not really have the mental capacity to form an intent to understand what they're really doing. So therefore, we create a lot of exceptions based on the concept of guilt. Plus, for example, we have an exception for what we call accidents. If, if I kill somebody by accident, that is not considered a crime. Just to let you know, that is not true in all cultures. In many cultures, many countries, there is no clear distinction between accidental death and intentional death. And you may be, go to prison for either one. Right? So again, keep in mind, the concept of crime, just like every other concept we discover, discussed in this class, is entirely socially created. It is not there, that it, something that exists in space. Now, the other thing we'll be obviously be discussing is the criminal justice system. 
the criminal justice system encompasses all those aspects of our state that deal with crime, such as, for example, the police force, uh, then, of course, prosecutor's office, defense attorney's offices, uh, the court system itself, and then finally probation and prison systems. Right? So these are all the, the, the system that deals with criminal acts, as it were. Now, the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, regularly publishes reports and updates on criminal activity that they gather from state and local agencies around the country. But they keep in mind, they focus primarily on eight index crimes. So if you look at them, for example, murder, robbery, burglary, uh, motor vehicle theft, rape, assault, theft, arson. What do are, what are all these have in common? They're all crimes against individuals. Uh, they notice that it doesn't include things like fraud. It doesn't include uh, white collar crimes. So, the, so clearly, right from the beginning, we see that the focus of crime is on primarily physical acts of of criminality rather than intellectual acts of criminality. Now, of course, there's some logic to this. People were obviously afraid of somebody doing violence to us. The idea is somebody might grab us in the middle of the night and beat us up and take our money. Well, obviously that's a scary thought. The idea that somebody might come into our house and take our belongings. Again, we think of that as an invasion of, of, of our privacy, an invasion of our space. Uh, not to mention, obviously, much more serious crimes like rape and murder. Um, but in reality, these crimes have been in decline since 1994, and we'll talk more about that later. Most victims, by the way, are not the victims of stranger attack. Uh, strangers attacking somebody is much rarer than somebody you know who attacks you. So even things like theft and burglary, people you know will know what you have to steal and they will burn, might know where you hide it, right? So, so there, you're much more likely to be robbed or burgled or attacked or assaulted uh, or murdered or even raped by somebody you know ahead of time than people you don't know. So with that kept in mind, uh, when you think about protecting yourself, Think about people you know who you don't trust or are a bit shady. Those are the people you need to think about. Crimes against property, of course, have also been dropping steadily since 1979. Juvenile crime. Now, people in this age group, generally between 13 and 18 years old, are the most likely to commit crimes and to be the victims of crimes. So this is partly because uh, you have gang activity, you have what we we talked about earlier, socialization crisis as people are growing up. They, they feel maybe that they're not respected within the family or their status. They, they feel, I'm an adult now, I should be able to do what I want, and my family doesn't respect that, but my friends do, so they get pulled into a gang or uh, a criminal subculture. Um, so that obviously is a big factor in criminality. So you tend to notice that criminal activity tends to be very high during these early years, and then it declines as people get old. Frankly, you know, when people are old, you just don't have the energy uh, to commit a crime, and uh, you can't run away as fast. So, <laughs> a lot of things you need to do to be a criminal, they just ain't happening. So, you gotta, you got to get an honest job. All right. So, here I am. So, um, now, oh, again, over time, uh, juveniles, uh, well, I just said that, declines with age. Difficulty of definition. Again, what is young? Like I said, we don't normally consider children as capable as forming 
a conception of guilt in the full sense. This is why certainly a five or a six year old, we would, we would have trouble prosecuting them for murder. Uh, with a 15, 16 year old, there's a lot more debate. Right? Typically we have a, a, a line of 18. Over 18 is considered age of consent. You're old enough to know what you're doing. So if you're older than 18, you definitely are treated as a full-fledged criminal. If you're under 18, then there's a lot of debate about how you should be treated. Generally, we tend to treat younger people than 18 more leniently. They're put into a juvenile justice system, which at least in theory is supposed to be more lenient. So again, this comes back to the question of guilt. Now, there's a lot of evidence, I would, I would add also, that even past the age of 18, up until the age of 23, 24, 25, a lot of people still have, have not fully developed the ability to think ahead, right? Like they can plan ahead, but they don't have a full idea of understanding the, you know, the conception of what might happen or what the results might be. And we know with criminal activity, a lot of it is based on people having false expectations of being able to get away with it, at least according to many of the theories, right? So many of the theories assume that people commit crime because they think, ah, hey, it's easy and I can get away with it, so therefore the risk is low. Um, and uh, and yeah, they get caught, right? Because they haven't really figured out how to, you know, what the consequences are, right? The reality is, you know, you, if you're regularly committing criminal activities, you're going to get caught, right? period. Now, there's another area, I should say, of, of activity which maybe has a much less chance of getting caught. That is white collar and corporate crime. And these are crimes committed by affluent people, often as a part of quote unquote regular business activities. So you can look up any of these examples, but just to, as a few, you have Enron, where this guy, Ken Lay, who looks like a very respectable businessman, managed to rob hundreds of millions of dollars or lost it or did something, um, hid it away, and he did end up going to prison because it was such a huge case. WorldCom was another example of the same uh, financial companies where money was being hidden all over the place. And uh, uh, again, some people did end up going to prison. But the prison terms we're talking about are like 18 months, 19 months, two years. We're talking about very small prison sentences considering the amount of damage these people did. These people not only stole or lost or misinvested hundreds of millions of dollars, they caused pension funds to collapse. Their employees were left without a job because they blew up the companies, basically. So thousands of employees lost their job. They lost their pensions. They were, were obviously damaged, right? All of that damage. And then, of course, other companies that were damaged that weren't able to recoup their costs or their losses um, and so on and so forth. So these companies ended up costing trillions. WorldCom caused a national collapse that the government had to do a bailout uh, of, of hundreds of billions of dollars. So, I mean, these are not small things, but yet the punishment is very light. We'll talk about that more t uh, in a bit. Part of it is that the criminal justice system is not prepared to deal with this type of crime. Again, when you look back at the FBI, the, the, all the crimes are physical crimes, right? The, our, our conception of a crime is a, is a thug hiding in the corner with a sock over his head, ready to jump at you, right? But uh, this guy, Ken Lay, and his buddies uh, are a substantial amount of the cost of crime. They probably cost far more to society in a monetary sense than all the thugs put together. But the FBI is not equipped in the same way. You have to have a huge amount of accountants. You have to track all the expenses. You have to follow the, the money. It's very difficult. Corporations have a lot of ways of hiding uh, criminal activity. And these people are smart. They're not stupid, right? They've gone to college. Um, and then, 
uh, corporations don't usually don't want to admit that they're even a victim of crime, right? Because if you go to your bank and they say, well, our, our chief executive officer just ran off with all your money, hmm, you're not going to trust that bank very much. High price lawyers, so they can hire $1,000 an hour lawyers, $2,000 an hour lawyers. They don't care, it's a business expense, right? So the lawyers are there not to tell them not to commit a crime, but to tell them how they can commit a crime without it looking like committing a crime. They're not supposed to, but again, these things happen. Finally, they don't look like criminals. So when this guy shows up in court, right? Oh, he's like, oh, look at me, I'm an honest citizen. I have a suit, I have a tie. I can't be a crook, so juries let them go. And we'll talk more about this later. Race has a lot to do with it. A lot of these uh, white collar criminals are white. And politics also. I remember when I was a teenager, this is back in the 70s, there was a big push by the FBI to focus on white collar crime. And they even had ads up all over the country uh, kind of playing a joke on a on a TV uh, commercial for, for Tide. Tide had a commercial about how to get rid of the ring around the collar in your, in your shirts, right? So the FBI had all these ads or billboard posters all over the country saying, we'll put a ring on white collar crime and the ring was, of course, uh, handcuffs. But then Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, and he immediately disbanded all of those offices and, and uh, the, all that focus on white-collar crime. Um, so there you go. By the way, Giuliani, who you might know uh, from recent events, uh, won some of his biggest early cases in those white-collar crime uh, bureaus in the FBI. And then there's government crime. So uh, governments write the law, but they don't always follow the law. So there, there are many examples of this um, where the government deliberately violates its own laws. I mean, you have cases of genocide and ethnic cleansing, right? Uh, governments obviously don't write laws saying you can kill anybody of a certain ethnic group, or at least this is not very common. But then they go ahead and they do it anyway, or they help promote it. In the United States, of course, there were a whole series of wars and acts, and in some cases, deliberate acts of genocide and ethnic cleaning against Native Americans, which clearly violated the laws of the time, uh, the way African Americans were treated. Again, most of the time that was done legally by passing laws uh, about slavery, about uh, passing laws about um, uh, treatment of African Americans even after slavery, but a lot of it was also done outside the law, such as lynchings and things of that nature. And then you have uh, obviously Nazi Germany, another example where uh, 11 million people were, were murdered, were taken out of their homes, literally put in concentration camps, and murdered, plain and simple. Um, and uh, again, in this case, this was all done uh, out, outside, against the law, right? But that, since the Nazis controlled the entire legal system, they were able to make sure that they were never prosecuted, as long as they controlled the system. Uh, Yugoslavia, again, you had uh, cases of genocide in Bosnia, Herzegovina, after Yugoslavia was broken up. Um, so other examples, uh, you have violations of the Constitution by officials. So this is typically, this is a criminal act, right? When officials violate the Constitution. Unfortunately, again, it's almost nobody has ever prosecuted for this, or, or as far as I know, in the United States at least, nobody has ever been prosecuted for violating the Constitution, because what they do is they just say, well, I'm interpreting it. This is my interpretation. And then it has to go up to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to decide whether or not that interpretation is correct. 
Uh, bribery and corruption. This is when officials take money in exchange for either uh, not enforcing the law or changing the law in the case of legislatures or in the case of a president, for example, not applying the law in the way it was supposed to be applied or giving specific companies uh, special benefits. So this, again, this happens worldwide, and again, you would be surprised to what extent this happens in the United States. And of course, you have fraud and embezzlement, people stealing from government funds or overcharging money to the government. Uh, these are all cases of fraud. Now, again, it's very hard to catch and punish these individuals. So the number of prosecutions in this area, I mean, you'll hear about them, but the, these are a, a very small percentage uh, of the amount of government crime that actually goes on. The problem is, of course, when you're prosecuting government crime, the people doing the criminal act are in the government. Right? And uh, if, the, if the corruption is endemic within the system, you have a case like with many, many countries in Latin America or Africa where uh, the if you complain about corruption, you will get killed or kicked out. Right? Because it, be, it becomes part of the government system. I think in most of Europe and the United States, it's not that bad, but there's a lot more government crime going on than we're aware of. Because like I say, it's people in the government doing it. So state crime is when the government uh, carries out some examples, for example, uh, um, in, in the West, we, like I said, we tend to assume that we don't, we're not as corrupt, but certainly in the past it was very common in the United States because of the very rapid expansion of the United States and uh, territories being formed and becoming states very quickly. So you had places like California and Texas where law and order was pretty uh, how do you say, fast and loose, right? So, uh, for example, in California, when you had the earthquake in 1906, um, only one building in the whole city fell down, and that was City Hall, because they just rebuilt it, they just rebuilt the City Hall, and it turns out the contractors had used garbage, <laughs> had used bad materials, uh, to build it, and all of this it turns out all these kickbacks and corruption going on. The Teapot Dome was another huge example. This was during the 1920s and uh, uh, dealt with uh, oil rights, uh, where the federal government basically was giving away oil to oil companies, and instead of getting collecting the money uh, for Indian tribes and for the federal government. They were keeping it for themselves, or they were kicking it back to the oil companies. Um, other, other cases, uh, for example, Watergate, which you may have heard of, happened in the 1960s. This is when Richard Nixon uh, essentially had a uh, dirty works department in his re-election campaign, and they, they played all kinds of dirty tricks on the Democrats to get the worst possible Democrat nominated so that Richard Nixon could defeat him in the election. And, they, and it worked. They got their candidate, and Richard Nixon got reelected. It wasn't until after that that all of this came out in the newspapers, and Richard Nixon was eventually forced to resign, which, if you think about it, is an amazing thing, because what he did was very small potatoes compared to other things, such as during the Reagan administration, you had the government, the military, sending plane loads of weapons to Iranian, to Iran, essentially to what we call today the Taliban. And this was when Reagan himself had said, we will never sell, he had executive orders, and then he violated the orders selling the guns directly to Iran, and in exchange, the money was used to fund a private war in Nicaragua against the government of Nicaragua, when Congress had said the United States cannot spend any money against the government of Nicaragua, very clearly, right?
but yet this money was being funneled back to Nicaragua. Um, and that's all very, very well established. What you might not, or less, a little less established, is the argument that the CIA also helped the Nicaraguan rebels channel cocaine into the United States in such massive numbers that it essentially dropped the price of cocaine in the United States by about 80% and caused a huge increase in uh, cocaine and particularly crack dependency in the United States, having a huge negative effect on the uh, on the economy uh, and the social life. Um, so, but none of that, none of that was ever prosecuted. A few people went to jail for what they called Iran Contra, a guy named Oliver North, but then he became a cultural hero um, and went on TV shows and had a TV show and radio shows as I believe still is around there uh, on the, in the right wing uh, radio network system. Violent crime, uh, victimless crimes and high tech crimes. So these are types of crimes where there's no clear victim. Uh, in fact, they may, no, they may not be a victim at all in the traditional sense. Uh, that, for example, I take your money, you're the victim, I'm the aggressor. But think about something like gambling, right? If we're gambling, we all have an agreement. And I'm not stealing your money as long as the gambling is, is fair. I'm just we're agreeing, okay, I'll pay you $10 if this happens, you pay me $10 if that happens. I mean, who's the victim? So uh, the argument is that the victim in these cases is society as a whole, that the social morals are uh, outraged that since most people in society don't want gambling, or at least a few powerful people don't want gambling, uh, therefore it violates that, that social uh, decorum. With drugs, it's the same thing. If I buy drugs from you and you're selling drugs to me, assuming again that the drugs are what they they are purported to be, where's the crime? Who, who, who's the victim? Right? Um, you can say that the drug buyer is the victim, but he's the one initiating the exchange. Right? He wants the drugs. Um, so, again, it's a question of who's the victim? Should this be criminalized? Right? In this case, there's a kind of a second argument, which is not just morality, but also public health. But this is something that is bad for the individual, and therefore, we need to criminalize it in order to protect the individual from himself. A bit like seatbelt laws, right, or helmet laws, right? We, we're going we're gonna to have a law that forces everybody to wear a seatbelt. Who's the victim if I don't wear a seatbelt? Me, right? I'm the one who's going to go through the window. Um, so, again, the, the point is, there is a debate. Should this be illegal or not? And, uh, of course... Uh, usually, uh, yes is the answer. It should be illegal uh, in society. Again, it's it's the, there are those points of debate. Prostitution is another uh, where uh, you could say, well, you're paying money for a service and so on and so forth. And so there are, of course, places where gambling is legal. In many, uh, the, the laws against gambling have have been relaxed significantly in the United States in recent decades. So you see gambling casinos in many places now that you didn't have before, but it still isn't widespread. It's still considered something of a, a controlled behavior. Uh, you can still be prosecuted for gambling if you are gambling outside one of those approved venues. Drug use, again, again, there's been some liberalization there in terms of some drugs like marijuana, but a lot of other drugs are still heavily criminalized. And prostitution, again, some places in the world uh, do legalize prostitution, or at least do not criminalize it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so again, that debate continues. Um, so, basically, the crime is considered criminal 
based on uh, definition of morality, based on uh, the notion of protecting the individual or protecting the, the the person, and sometimes based on the overall that there's a threat to society, public health threat, or some other notion. Another type of crime, which of course is, is in debate, or not in debate, but uh, relevant, is high-tech crime, because of course this is new. Right? Whenever there's a new technology, that's going to create new opportunities for crime. Right? So, uh, for example, when people first started printing books, you could print up false information, right? Or, or information at least the government didn't want you to print. That would be considered a crime. Now, of course, we have all this uh, electronic, the internet, uh, computers, cell phones. Almost everybody has access to the internet. So this creates the opportunity for high-tech crime. Uh, essentially, crashing into somebody's account, or hacking is the, the technical term, hacking into somebody's account to steal information, maybe steal money, use their credit card information to purchase things, which then you can resell. So rather than simply stealing with them their money from their hands, you can steal it through the internet. And then of course the other things, child pornography, credit card fraud, piracy that is selling something that you don't have the right to, uh, Mail bombs, well, bombs through the mail, that's a bit older technology. Right? Uh, but certainly you can have viruses, uh, use viruses to attack companies. And this has actually been a very big uh, deal in recent history because you have hackers that create a virus uh, and you send it to attack a company and then you tell them, okay, uh, I can sell you the antidote to that virus for $100,000, right? Or you have a virus that locks people's accounts and then they have to call in and basically pay money to get their accounts unlocked, right? So again, these would be considered criminal acts because you are uh, forcing somebody to do something you didn't agree to. Right? Uh, and identity theft at the end of the day, of course, is, uh, is another example where uh, high tech has allowed certain types of crimes to occur much more easily. As we talked about drugs, of course, society defines which drugs are deviant, which drugs are not. There's a lot of obviously legal drugs, medicine, but a lot of those legal drugs have psychotropic effects. So they are, they are what we call controlled drugs. So there, you can buy them, but you have to have a prescription, and the use of these drugs without a prescription is then illegal. Um, now, in, besides the direct effect of drugs themselves, or the buying and selling and use of drugs, the argument is that drugs can often use or lead to secondary crimes. So, for example, crimes committed while you're on drugs, right? So you, you take some cocaine, and you feel powerful, I can go steal that guy's money. Right? So that's, that's a possible uh, lead on effect. Uh, property crime to pay for drugs, you steal in order to be able to afford your drug habit. Uh, and then of course another big fact in drugs uh, in crime is the use of violence to control the drug marketplace. Right? And this we saw very, very much in the 1990s and early 2000s, where gangs in inner cities particularly, but other neighborhoods as well, they would control the drug sales in that area, and it could be very, very lucrative. You're talking about millions of dollars, right? Or hundreds of millions of dollars. So these gangs can afford to buy guns, they can afford to buy other types of weapons, and next thing you know, you've got gang warfare going on because the, the guy with the better weapon is going to come in, wipe out the other guy, and put in their own cells. Now, um, there's a lot of evidence that when you simply illegalize uh, drugs, criminalize drugs, this may increase these secondary crimes. So, for example, when prohibition was passed in the 19... 
20s, uh, that was when alcohol sales were prohibited by federal, well, by the federal constitution, right? it actually created a huge explosion of secondary crimes because you had all these mafias competing with each other to supply alcohol illegally and it was unregulated. So the police and the courts couldn't intervene. They had to sort it out by killing each other. Right? So uh, there is a lot of strong arguments that criminalization may increase crime in itself. Legalization therefore may reduce the crime. Um, and in some cases reduce it entirely, right? Because all the, the reasons for committing crime will be taken care of. For example, if smoking marijuana is legal, you can go with your friends, chill out, smoke some marijuana, and well, marijuana is not going to make you particularly violent, usually, right? So you're going to just chill, you're not going to commit crimes, uh, it's legal, so it's cheap, so you don't have to commit a crime to pay for the drugs any more than you might have to commit a crime to buy bread or lettuce. And you don't need to control the market because the government or the private sector controls the market. And they can call, if there's any trouble, they just call the police, right? Can you imagine a drug dealer calling the police? Hey, there's other drug dealers trying to muscle in my territory. Come and help, come and help me out. It's like, well, oh, you're illegal, so we have to arrest you. There you go. Okay, so we'll just stop there for now and join us for the next lecture where we'll continue with the discussion of crime and uh, the criminal justice system. Yay!